just as it really can't touch nobody, but let's have let's have a 10 second testimony meeting. Turn and tell somebody, testify about the good things that God has done for you. Come on, come on, testify. Come on, testify.
Let's read all together. As the chosen people of God, then the holy people whom he loves, we are to be clothed in heartfelt compassion, in generosity and humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with one another, forgive each other. The Lord has forgiven you. Now you must do the same. Amen. Come on, give God praise for his word. You may be seated. Deacon Smith, if you'll come and read our statement of purpose tonight. with us again. Come on, Mathalia, let's greet them with a hand of appreciation. So I'm going to be up and forth being with us all tonight. Keep those hands back and it's giving time. Amen. I'm going to ask if our officers who are on duty, if they will come quickly. Amen. If they will come. And as we lift up our offering tonight. Amen. You've already purposed in your heart what you're going to give. And I pray that you will be a cheerful giver for the Lord loves a cheerful giver and I will have you know that not because I'm pastor this church but this is good ground amen and when you sow seed you sow for a harvest and you want to sow in good ground and we believe God that God will do just what he said God will bless you when you sow do I have anybody who believes that and know that God will do just what he said so again as we give tonight we're asking that you will do that we're going to walk tonight we're going to do that amen 
allow you to stretch your legs again before we get to the word of God. If you have your offering, just lift that toward the Lord. We do that here at the church. We lift our offering because what you have in your hand is more than an offering. It is a seed. And we know that God certainly will definitely give seed to the sower. Father, again, we thank you so much for all that you have done and what you continue to do. You have allowed us again to be able to earn wages and be able to sow them into the kingdom of God. So as we do with God, let us have the right attitude. Your word teaches that you love a cheerful giver. And bless those who wanted to give but just did not have. Allow them to come and present their bodies as living sacrifices. God, we know that you will uh, turn their situation around. And we're sowing tonight for that. We're sowing for our youth. We're sowing for our ministry. We're sowing to be able to aid those in the community. We love you. We bless you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Let's stand up in there. What happened to outside house? Can you please stand? All those on the outside of house, will you please stand? And by the rest of us,
ain't done anything for anybody. Thanks. 
get that word. Yeah. Saints get a word. Amen. Amen. And so he's going to come tonight in his own way. And he's going to come and he's going to preach to us. And I told him, I said, man, you went to the crib, man. So you know how you act at the crib. Just do what you do. Amen. But I want him to know publicly how much I appreciate him and love him and the both of you. We thank God for you. Christy and the worship dance are going to bless us with a song that is suitable and sets our heart and set the atmosphere for preaching. And after they have rendered the selection, the next voice you will hear is none other than Pastor William Montgomery Jr. Receive him by the elevation of your right hand. Will you point it at him and say, God bless Pastor Montgomery. Pastor Montgomery, do what you do. Preach the word in this house. And after you have taught us, give us a mind to obey and do what we've been taught. Now come on, clap your hands with expectation.
fill up a box of food and bring it back so me and her could eat. When we would travel to Huntersville to go shopping, all of the various memories that we have, it just reminds me of how much I love Lucretia. She makes my medicine. She cooks my food, changes my band-aid. She does everything for me. I don't know how I would make it without her. But forgive me, baby, as much as I love Lucretia, there's some things that I just can't stand. One is she does not make decisions well. I'm talking especially about when we go eat. She can never decide where to eat. Now, in all fairness, her and my sister will tell you, whenever it's time to decide where to eat, I will always change my mind. We're going to go to Applebee's. We'll pull up to the parking lot, and I say, I actually want to go to go to Correct. But they get frustrated with me because I can't seem to make a decision. But as a Baptist preacher, there's another group of people that irritate me to no end. It is those who sit in pews week after week and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ presented, but they can't seem to make a decision. The people need to understand that we are not here to entertain you. We're not here to give you motivational pep talks in order to get you through your week. But what we do when we stand behind this sacred desk is that we are urging and pleading with you to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is for those who are lost in the room. But for those of us who are saved and sanctified in the room, we are trying to get you to fear the God you claim to serve. To love Him. Folks shouldn't have to urge you to worship and boost and build you up. And shouldn't have to tell you what to say and when to say it and how to say it. But if God has done anything for you, you ought to be ripping the roof off of this place. The reason why the redeemed, the reason why the children of the living God have a reason and a right to praise is because of what lies ahead for us in eternity. God has created a home for us to dwell. It is a home full of rich and prosperous blessings. And if you belong to Jesus Christ tonight, and only if you belong to Jesus Christ, it will soon be your home. As we look at our text tonight in Luke chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and his disciples. He says everyone gathered around him and he's beginning to tell them about how one can get in to heaven. Heaven is real. And if you believe heaven is real, alternatively, you must believe hell is real. Jesus is going to tell a parable. He's talking to these Pharisees, to be exegetical for you theologians in the room. He's been talking to the Pharisees about their money problem. See, the problem is not having money. I know some of you want to have money. All of us want to have money. The problem is not having money. The problem is money having you. And this is the problem that we find with these Pharisees. Jesus is talking to those who are the outcasts of society, those to whom we would turn our nose up, those to whom we wouldn't invite to our homes for dinner. He's, he's talking to them, and he's inviting them to come to him. But these Pharisees are turning up their long noses at Jesus' crowd. So Jesus now turns his attention from the crowd, and he focuses on them. And he tells them this parable. The parable is a series of contracts. Uh -huh. You have a very wealthy man, and you have a very poor man. Uh -huh. Now, before you get the wrong idea and leave this place thinking that I was teaching some twisted theology, I'm not teaching that you go to heaven, go to hell for uh, being rich. I'm not teaching that you will go to heaven for being broke. That was the case. I think many of us in the room will be on our way to heaven. That is not what Jesus is teaching. If you pay close attention to the text, you'll 
soon discover that right. Jesus is teaching I like you, those who believe and live like they believe yeah. are on their way yeah. to heaven. Yeah. Those of us in the room who don't believe are on our way to hell. Hell is a hard subject to talk about in the church in 2021. People want to talk about health, wealth, and prosperity. They want to talk about how God can protect and what God can do. And all of those things aren't true. But if you are a child of God, Christ left us with some marching orders. He said, go into all the world and teach the gospel. But there's a reason why he wants us to teach it. Because those who embrace it will have him. And that is the greatest prize. You do not come to Christ for comfort. Because in this life, Jesus says, you shall, not might. You shall, not maybe. You shall. I'll just go to food like It's a fine establishment. If I can paint a picture for you. But this rich man, he ate steak 48, not occasionally. Not on a, 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 an occasion. He ate like this every single day. Probably was a healthy man. Probably had personal trainers running around his house. So he probably looked good and was in good shape. He just ate like that just to show off in front of people. But we contrast it with this beggar. Notice the rich man has no name. Some of you may have translation in which it says Davies. Davies is the Latin term for rich man. Rich man. He has no name. And notice that the beggar has a name. Yeah. And I like the beggar's name. Oh, sir, the beggar's name is Lazarus. Lazarus means God helps. There's somebody in this room who like can say, brother. you might not know my name, but there's one thing you need to know about me, is that God helped me. When I was broke, God met my need. When I was sick, God healed my body. When I didn't think I could make it, God gave me the strength. Is there anybody in the room who can say that God completely, totally different lives. One lives with the best that life has to offer. Another lives at the very bottom rung of society. One has an iPhone and iPad and, and multiple TVs scattered around his sprawling mansion with a, a glorious feast before him every single day. But, but, but Lazarus is at his gate begging. All of his baller friends who come in and out of these lavish dinners are met by this beggar. He's sitting at the gate. Can you not see him with your sanctified imagination? He has a cup in his hand. He says, brother, can you spare me a little bit of change? He watches through uh, the glass window and he sees them eating every single day. And he's not wondering to himself, can I get a seat at that table? He's not thinking to himself, well, wow. any of them bring me a plate when this thing is over. Yeah. No, the Bible says the only thing that is on his mind is can I get some crumbs? Oh, man can't even get a crumb off of this rich man's table. And the sad thing is that this rich man is church folk. Wow. I don't know because later on in the text, we're going to see he's going to cry out, Father Abraham. It's like a good type of stuff. Ugly religion in a beautiful place. Did this man claim to love God, claim to walk the ways of Christ, but he ignores the needs and the wants of those who are beneath him. Friend, that may be you and me. We may not have it made. We may not be Jay-Z or Puff Daddy. We may not have fat bank accounts. But are there anyone around you in need and you turn up your face to them? So, so Jesus introduces us to these two characters. They live very differently. As I said, one's rich, one's poor. But that's not really the difference. The difference is one has his faith firm in Christ while the other one is a hypocrite. For a friend, there's only really two kinds of people in the room tonight. 
those who know the hymns and, and know the prayers and, and know how to, to look like they're on fire for Christ and those who really are. But that, that's really the only distinction. So let me ask you a question. Which group are you in? Which one do you belong to? Uh, do you have the, the blessings of Christ? I love how Paul puts it in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, blessed be the Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. Where there is blessing in heavenly places. Friends, if you belong to Christ, you have everything. If you don't belong to Christ, you don't have anything. So there's two ways to live. For Christ and against Christ. And notice verse 22. Yes, sir. There's two ways to die. To die. To die. <laughs> Notice that both men die. As different as their lives are, as diametrically opposed as they are to one another, there is one common denominator. They die. Studies been done. One in every one person dies. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how cute you are. I don't care how educated or holy you are. You live in this life long enough, you're going to die. So many people are afraid of coronavirus, but would that they would be afraid of God. Would that they would fear God the way they fear this virus. Because I don't care how much you take care of yourself, and you need to take care of yourself, this life's coming to an end. Both of these men die. But they don't die in the same way. Notice, the rich man dies and he's buried. He's buried. Lazarus dies and he's carried to the bosom of Abraham. So he's carried to the bosom of Abraham is a euphemism for heaven. Yeah. He's going to sit at the seat of the faithful. Does anybody know who Abraham is? Abraham is the one who the Bible says is a friend of God. He's the one that Genesis 15, 6 says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He goes from death to intact body and soul by the angels to the bosom of of Abraham. Yeah. And don't get it twisted. Jesus is telling a, a fanciful story to make a point. Now you, when you die, when I die, we're not going to be carried body and soul yes. to heaven. Yes. And we know that because we come to funerals. We yes. see the body roll down the aisle and set in front of us and we know that the body is going in the ground but the soul is going to be with the Lord. Yeah. But Jesus wants to make the point that there is a difference between these two men. Lazarus dies and he's carried to heaven. Notice that the rich man dies and he's buried. No burial is mentioned for Lazarus. Lazarus did not have a burial because he was poor. And as a poor man, the Pharisees, you know, those religious people, they would have looked down on Lazarus and they would have thrown his body in a heap in Gehenna. They would have burned as those who are cursed by God. And they would have looked at him as one who God had turned his back on. That they looked at him just like they looked at the disabled, the sick, the lame, that those who, who don't have it the way they're supposed to have it had to do something wrong and be punished by God. This is the same theology that Job's friends have. Come on, Job. Tell the truth. You know you did something. Ain't no way you'd be going through all of this mess unless you had messed up. Job, what did you do? If you had just admit it, God will make all of these things go away. But there's some preachers who do that today. They preach that health, wealth, and prosperity stuff. If you seek, you must have seen. You must have sinned. But that is not the way it works, friends. Sometimes things happen in this life in order for God to show his own glory. Jesus said to a blind man in John chapter 9, it is not that this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. So, so, so both of these men died. Friend, there's someone in this room tonight who needs to believe you can die. A lot of times when we're young, we think we can't die. We almost think we're invincible. We almost think time is not going to turn its back on us. I can remember, I saw my fate 
before me, Pastor Hamill, I was taking my dad to uh, the doctor in Shelby. And they were talking to him about his, his kidneys. And they told me that I had a little bit of protein in mine. But you know what I thought to myself? I said, you know what? He's 46. And see, to my mind back then, that was old. He's 46. He's old. Well, I got, I got plenty of time. That's right. I'll keep on doing my thing. I'll keep on drinking. I hope that doesn't offend somebody in the room, but it's no, part of my yeah. testimony. I'll keep on drinking. I'll keep on eating like I want to do. And one day, down the road, I'll get it together. But I found out real quick, one day might not never come. All of us, no matter how healthy we are, no matter how young and strong we are, all of us are going to meet our demise. So both of these men died. Oh, their stories are so different. Because Lazarus dies and he's experiencing all of the blessings of heaven. All of us who are preachers of the gospel, we are so, uh, so thankful when we preach uh, the funeral of a saint. Because we know what awaits them. We know that what we're preaching about, what we're getting happy about, they're enjoying right now. Those who are in your family, those who are close to you, who died in Christ, are experiencing bliss on a whole nother level. Something that you can never think about. I have not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of mind what God has prepared for those who love him. Lazarus is enjoying heaven. He's in the bosom of Abraham. But most importantly, he's in the presence of Christ. And he's experiencing all that he heard in Sunday school, all that he heard in the worship service, but not the rich man. The rich man is in agony. The Bible says that he lifted his eyes in toward me. There's two ways to live. There's two ways to die. And lastly, there's two places to spend eternity. Notice that Lazarus is in heaven. Heaven, sweet heaven. Does anybody in the room know about heaven? There's some people I want to see when I get to heaven. I want to see my grandma Janetta. I want to see my papa Frank. I want to see my oh, Uncle Pete. I want to see my Uncle Pastor Montgomery. Lord knows I want to see my daddy again. As I stand here tonight, I can tell you the truth. When I get to glory, and I can hear Carolyn singing it now, when I get in glory, I'm not going to be looking for any of them. Because I've got to meet the man who loved me before I left. The one who walked the best of streets of Palestine, who, who did good, who opened up blind eyes, who raised folk from the dead. I've got to meet him, and I've got to tell him how much I love him. If there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, if you know his name. Stand to your feet and say it with me. I've got to see Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I also need to speak to some in the room tonight, briefly before I leave, about the other side of that reality. Notice that this, this, this rich man finds himself in hell. He opens his eyes and he's in torment. The word means constant, perpetual pain. Heaven is eternal and real, and so is hell. And this man is suffering. But I want you to note something. Hell does not rehabilitate anybody. It's not remedial. Hell is punitive. It is intense, long suffering. This man is no different than when he died. He, he was arrogant while he walked this earth. He thought he was something. He thought he was somebody. And he thought people were put on earth to serve him. So a, a conversation ensues 
with this breech man. He turns to Abraham and he, he cries out. In other words, he, he yells, hey, Abraham. But it doesn't just say Abraham. Notice what he says, Father Abraham. He, he's appealing now to his race, to his status. He, he's a child of Abraham. But, 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 but Jesus says he could raise up children of Abraham from these stones. But these Jews would often well, brag about the fact that they were the seed of Abraham. Uh, don't think it's irrelevant because some of us in the room do this also. I'm the grandson of so and so. I'm the son of so and so. I'm the daughter of so and so. But listen friends, it don't matter who mama believed in. It don't matter who daddy believed in. You better know Jesus for yourself. He says, Father Abraham, don't miss it. Notice no, no, what he asked him. Sin, Lazarus. Yeah. Wow. Notice the audacity, the arrogance of this man. Sin, Lazarus. To go get a little bit of water. Put a drop on my tongue. Why does he want this? Not because a drop of water is going to to alleviate all of his pain. Not, not, not because he can get a pipeline from heaven and, and drink to his soul's content. No, he just wants a little bit of relief from this pain. So he says, send Lazarus to give me a drop of water. And I'm glad Abraham ain't like some of us in the room. Because we would have said, oh, no, you ain't. <laughs> Wouldn't even give Lazarus a crumb off your table. Now you want to drop on your tongue. No, no, because of what you have done and how you have lived, you are, are to here to, to suffer eternally. Listen, friends, this is a true and, and, and deep reality. Those who are in hell are not changed. They are the same people they were before they got there, and they don't want to get out. Notice he doesn't ask for God. He doesn't ask for Jesus. He says, send Lazarus down here. And, and Abraham says, well, 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 that's not possible. Uh, two reasons. One, because there's been a gulf fixed between you and us so that nobody here can come to you and you cannot come to us. Uh, and why would anybody want to leave the glories of hell to go to hell? Well, if you see a, a child in hell, maybe you would want to go. If you see a friend in hell, Maybe you would want to go and give them some relief, but, 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 but Abraham says it's not even possible. And as a side note, this is a fanciful story. It's really not possible to have a conversation from hell to heaven. But Jesus is doing it this way in order to make a point. Now this man wants uh, Lazarus to come and relieve him, but he says to Abraham, well, okay, since he can't come to relieve me, Send it to my house. I've got some brothers over there. Warn them that they will not come to this place. My oh, friends, when you, if you end up in hell, if you find yourself suffering with the damned, you might have this same desire. Uh, Lord, send them a preacher. Send, send them a deacon. Send, send somebody by my house and warn my family not to come to this place. Uh, remember I told you hell is not remedial. So notice that this man does not now have a heart for the world. He does not say send Lazarus into all the world and tell every boy, girl, and man and woman about this man named Jesus. Tell them what I did not listen to. Tell them the good news so that they would not come to this place. No, he's only concerned concerned about his brothers. Send me to my brother's house. I love uh, Abraham's reply. I just love it. He says, uh, no, I'm not going to send him. And here's why. They got Moses and the prophets. In other words, they got the word of God. But they don't have hucksters in the pulpit. They got the word of God. They don't have get-overs on a TV screen trying to get you money. They've got the word of God. There's no reason to send Lazarus to them. Why? Because if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen even if one comes from the dead. 
Why did Jesus say that? Because he knew that there was a man named Lazarus, and Jesus raised him from the dead. Jesus came up to the tomb, and they said, Behold, he stinketh. Jesus told them to call him out. Mm. Roll back the stone. And he says, Lazarus. I love that old preacher said, if he wouldn't have said his that's name, it, the it. whole graveyard would have come walking out. But he says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes shimmying out in his grave clothes. They take the clothes off and Lazarus is right before their face, alive and well. And did that create mass conversions? No. Did that make them turn and want to serve Jesus? No. Did that make them ask Peter, how can I sign up to be an apostle, a disciple? No. What did it do? It caused them to get harder in their unbelief and they wanted to come and kill Jesus all the more. Not only was a man named Lazarus raised from the dead. One Friday, Jesus went to a place called Calvary. He had been beat all night long. Jesus can serve being beat all night long. We ought to be serving with all of this luxury that surrounded us. They beat him all night long. They spit on him. They called him names. They took his hand. They stretched him out wide. They nailed his hands to an old rugged cross. They, they put him up high. He, he hung down his head and he died. Do you believe Jesus died? I not believe it, but old Calvary, he died. He gave up his ghost. He said, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus died, but I'm so glad that is not where the story is. Early on Sunday morning, before the dew even dropped, before there was an echo of light in the sky, he got up with all power in his hands. And Jesus came back and folks still won't believe. So he says, it don't matter if somebody comes back from the dead, you've got Moses and the scriptures. But can I tell you tonight in Waco in 2021, we've got something even better than Moses and the prophets. We've got Paul and the apostles. But we've got epistles of the New Testament. We've got uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. More than that, we've got Jesus. And Jesus is telling all of us in the room, we need to come to him. So friends, you need to ask yourself tonight, which way will I choose? Am I going to follow my own self, my own way, my own thing? Or am I going to follow the one who gave his everything so that I might have eternal life? Praise God.
revival service that you attend. That's not going to get you into heaven. I don't care how much scripture you know. That's not going to get you into heaven. What will get you into heaven? Do you apply the scripture? Do you live the scripture? Thank you. That word tonight.
also are still here, uh, in need of candor. So we ask that you continue to bring those as well. Next Wednesday, if the Lord will tarry and give us grace, we shall conclude our revival services with the Reverend Roger Fuller. Amen. Sunday. Looking forward to that. Again, we ask everyone uh, to be, of course, with the exception of the ushers, because they're on duty, uh, to be in a black suit, purple tie for men, or black dresses for ladies, and purple flower. Amen. As we shall celebrate the Lord, uh, keeping us together. Amen. As a church family celebrating another year of uh, our anniversary and homecoming. And we'll have a dinner uh, at the end of the worship. I have. I have asked all of the sons of the ministry to come and share the dinner with us. Amen. Fast all for come. Name all for the Senate to come. And I was sharing with some earlier today uh, that we're doing this because God has been good to Macedonia. Amen. And we want to share all together. Amen. And come and worship and share and honor the Lord for all that he has done for us. Amen. He is going to come back with the final remarks and the benediction on tonight. Let's stand and receive Pastor William Munger.